This is the archive of the Vereinigung der Berlinen Künstlerinnen in Österreichs, the Austrian Association of Women Artists, abbreviated as Fabrika U in German. When we became aware of the existence of the Fabrika U around 2007, we were immediately intrigued. The histories of the Fabrika U draw us in. They draw us in, but they can also drag us down into their haunting presence. This is the archive of the Vereinigung der Bildenden Künstlerinnen Österreichs, the Austrian Association of Women Artists. It includes 22 meters of shelved folders, as well as books and printed works that are currently stored on the shelves of the former Secretariat of the Association. Some of the materials are kept in acid-free cardboard boxes, and others can be found on the open shelves. There are also 359 works, prints, drawings, and paintings in a plain chest in another room of the association. The material is divided into the categories Arch for archive, Druck for print, and Werk for work. And each is numbered consecutively in ascending order, starting from number one. The numbers can be seen on the backs of the boxes and the books. The materials in the blue cardboard boxes consist of the Secretariat's documentation since the year 1910, the year the association was founded. It contains writing, objects, and images which were noted or processed in the Secretariat and which were retained for the sake of documentation or even by accident. The archive of an association includes documents, such as statutes, minutes, and correspondences. And in the case of an artist association, it also includes a collection of artworks. The archive also contains things that basically do not belong such as the record book of the Bund Österreichische Frauenvereine, Austrian Federation of Women's Associations, which is referred to in the archive's inventory list as the diary of the fifth president of the VBKU. Among the invoices, documents, phone bills, loan papers, documents regarding support funding, business cards, obituaries, correspondences, programs of conferences and meetings, annual reports, legal affairs, invitations and official correspondences. We also run into dialogues and disputes for which we are not able to find any categories in the inventory list. How did this archive come into existence? When were all these materials officially referred to as an archive? And how were the decisions made regarding which materials would be kept in the archive? The archivist, Sabine Harik, who compiled the archive's inventory list with its categories and numbers 10 years ago, explained to us that you can find the president's personal desk files from the very beginning of the association. She claimed that these actually do not belong to the association and pointed out that there are property rights connected to those documents. She said, keep in mind, these remain valid for 70 years after someone's death. That's a long time. Die Unterlagen, die heute Teil des VBKÖ Archivs sind, befanden sich zuvor in der Wohnung der siebten Präsidentin Friedel Korkoran, gleich neben den Vereinsräumlichkeiten. Die neunte Präsidentin Rudolfine Lackner hat sie mir übergeben. Teilweise war das Material in Mappen vorsortiert. Das habe ich dann strukturiert. 
The documents in the archive provide insight into the activities, structure, and objectives of the association. They give insight into intrigues, responsibilities, and ambitions. What we do not find in the archive are decisions that were made in the corridor, opinions that were not expressed, testimonies of resistance that did not make it into the archive, or things that were taken out or were never included to begin with. And there are documents that are evidently missing. The minute books from the years 1931 to 1938 are not in the archive, and the first pages of the minute book from 1938 to 1944 have been cut out. The documents talk. They talk about, for, back, with, and against each other. They affect us. They evoke emotions that draw our attention and influence our observations. They influence what we understand, which stories we read, and what we write. What do the affects trigger when we thumb through the documents, read the minutes, rifle through the boxes, or look at images? What do the affects trigger when we look at this image? This is the only group photo in the Faubicou's archive. It shows a group of white, well-dressed people who we interpret as women. They have hats on and are holding purses, and two are wearing dead foxes. Some of them are looking into the camera, some are looking away. The group was organized in a strict fashion against a backdrop of a wall of plants. The women in the front row are sitting in chairs, the rest of the group is standing in the second row behind them. What escapes our conscious perception and our language? On the back of the reproduction, you can read that the group photo was taken by the photographer Marek. The date is unknown. In the inventory list, it says that the image was created in 1925. In the 2010 centennial publication for the association's 100-year anniversary, the image is marked as Faubicou board during the 1930s. The Faubicou was founded in 1910. It opened its space in Maize Edogasse in 1912, where it remains active to this day. Its original statutes outlined the objectives of the association as Firstly, the advancement of artistic relations for women artists in Austria. Secondly, for the promotion of professional interests. And thirdly, the enhancement of economic circumstances through the establishment of exhibition possibilities. Today, when in the association, on the fourth floor of the building, we are often asked which street the windows of the exhibition room face. When the windows are open, we can hear the street musicians playing songs all day long on Kentnerstrasse. The group photo shows 20 artists who are all members of the Faubikeu. 18 of them are unknown to us and haunt the archive as the unknown. The specters make it possible to speak through their nearly imperceptible histories and to reflect on their underlying structures of self-empowerment and oppression. Even if they may be objectionable or dangerous ghosts, it's about giving contradictory voices the chance to speak. Our names are Nina Huchtel and Julia Wieger. We have been part of the board of the Fabrika U since the beginning of 2012. The board consists of eight members who run the association collectively. Our main tasks are the conceptualization and the production of the annual program, which consists of exhibitions, workshops, talks, and other events, in addition to taking care of the association's archive. In the fall of 2012, we founded the working group Secretariat for Ghosts, Archival Politics, 
and gaps in order to structurally anchor a critical analysis of our association's history. Which ghosts must the archive draw out or cast out? Which must it avoid, preserve, or even defend? Aside from humidity, mold, and insects, which other forces obstruct the archiving process? Which memories are preserved in the archive? What cannot be documented? How do the documents talk back? How can a critical self-assessment be put into progress? Which images does the affect obstruct? Which role does the body play in analysis? In the second row, fourth from the right, we see Helene von Kaus. The Baroness and Painter was born in Vienna in 1876, and she died in Milstadt in Carinthia in 1950. She was one of the co-founders of the Faubico. She was its second president from 1916 to 1923, and its treasurer from 1929 to 1944. Helene Krauss's book, We Thank Our Führer, was published by the Kühne Verlag in 1940. One year prior, the same publisher released the Führer's Youth Sites. When checking out the book at the National Library, we see on the inside cover that the book was banned for a while, probably because it was regarded as Nazi propaganda after 1945. remind us that no research and no processes of coming to terms with history can be fair. It is rather about, in the words of philosopher Jacques Derrida, living with ghosts and spirits. It is about having this being with ghosts announce something which is in a process of becoming and remains in a process of becoming. Lernen, mit den Gespenstern zu leben, in der Unterhaltung, der Begleitung oder der gemeinsamen Wanderschaft. Im umgangslosen Umgang mit den Gespenstern. Und dieses Mitsein mit den Gespenstern wäre auch, nicht nur, aber auch, eine Politik des Gedächtnisses, des Erbes und der Generationen. Okay. 
In the first row, second from the left, we see Louise Frankelhahn. The painter was born in Vienna in 1878. She had her first exhibitions in the Hagenbund and then in the Secession before she co-founded the Faubicau in 1910. She was the third president of the Faubicau from 1923 to 1938. In the 1920s, Frenkel, Hahn, and Krauss worked together on an ambitious project, building an artist's refuge in the countryside with the primary aim of supporting needy, sick, and elderly artists by providing them with an option for a low-cost place for healing. The Kunstlerheim Association was founded in 1920 through the initiative of the Faubikeu. After several moves, it settled for a sizable house consisting of many rooms and a garden in Ollersbach, a small town located near the railroad not far from Vienna, in 1926. The house was provided to the association by the Faubikeu member, artist Wilhelmina Fürst. The Faubikeu supported the artist's refuge by organizing exhibitions whose proceeds went to the refuge. For instance... They set up a lottery in 1925 which offered paintings, etchings, and ceramics for preserving and expanding the refuge. The flyer representing the artist refuge reads that the refuge aims first and foremost to provide opportunities for recovery to visual artists, as well as musicians, writers, and practitioners of other free creative professions and their dependents, while also offering a comfortable, unconstrained sojourn in the countryside at an affordable rate, with acknowledged good cuisine and embarrassing cleanliness. The refuge is well located with forests and the railroad nearby. It is dry, protected from the wind, has excellent drinking water, and dust-free light rooms. It is an hour from Vienna by train. The artist's refuge is a good example of how the early representatives of the Faubikeu recognized artistic ambitions in relation to economic and social conditions. In 1936, Frankel, Hahn, and Krauss deemed that the establishment of the Ollersbach Artist Refuge, which was realized under extreme difficulties, can be considered a great accomplishment which stood in the service of the entire artistic community of Austria. After the National Socialist Party came to power in 1938, its Jewish owner, Wilhelmine Fürst, was forced to sell the house and the property of the artist refuge to the municipality of Ollersbach. The refuge was shut down, and Wilhelmina I died four years later at the age of 58 in the 2nd District of Vienna. The Faubikeu fulfilled the requirements of the Reichskommissar, or the Reich's regulatory body, implemented for the annexation of Austria with the German Reich. It changed its name to Kunstlerverband Wiener Frauen and expelled its Jewish members. Following the ruling of the Restitutions Commission in 1948, the township of Ollersbach was obligated to return the land and house to the nephews of Wilhelmina I. In 1978, a married couple from Vienna bought the former Kunzlerheim. The new owners adapted the house over the following years. In 2003, they installed a sign on the facade that refers to the history of the former Kunzlerheim. In March of 2016, during our visit, they guide us through the big house and show us a self-portrait which was painted by one of the guests of the Kunzlerheim.
Persecuted as a Jew, Frankel Hahn went into exile in 1938 in Paris, where she died in 1939. We know that at least 19 members left the country in 1938 due to the threat posed by the National Socialists, or that they were barred from the Faubikeu. We know that at least seven members were murdered in ghettos or concentration camps, or they committed suicide out of despair. What do the affects trigger when we read this letter? After Frankel Hahn's immigration, the painter Stephanie Hollenstein took over as president of the association. She remained in that function until her death in 1944. Hollenstein was born in 1986 in Lustenau in Vorarlberg. She studied at the Royal School of Arts and Crafts in Munich from 1904 to 1908. Hollenstein was a war enthusiast. In the First World War, she went to war dressed as a man under the name Stefan Hollenstein. She served on the Dolomite Front until August 1915, when her superior officer realized she was not a man. She worked as a war correspondent afterwards. She moved to Vienna after the war, where she met her life partner, the physician Dr. Franziska Gross. Even before 1938, Hollenstein was already a member of the National Socialist Party, which was illegal at that time in Austria. After Stephanie Hollenstein's death, her sisters took over her artistic estate from the township of Lustenau. 94 oil paintings, 150 watercolors, 870 drawings, sketches, and studies. A few years later, they gave the township the entire real estate of the Hollenstein family. And since 1961, the Stephanie Hollenstein Foundation has been responsible for taking care of the artistic estate. Many of its personal documents, letters, and photos are located in the historical archive of Lustenau. In 1971, 
the township founded the Stephanie Hollenstein Gallery, where the family home was located. During our visit in June of 2016, the gallery's director guided us through the exhibition and told us that this painting shows the Monte Cristallo from a similar perspective as in the film The Blue Light by Leni Riefenstahl and Bella Bolash. Was vielleicht auch noch dazu zu fügen ist, ist, dass wie die, als die VPK gegründet wurde, dass, ähm, äh, dass, die, dass, die, dass Frauen weder ähm, an der Akademie der Bildenden Künste studieren konnten, noch Mitglieder bei der Sozession in der Sozession werden konnten. At the beginning of its activity in 2012, the board members of the VBKÖ agreed that the association should be positioned as a critical space, dedicated to fostering contemporary feminist and queer agendas, in order to support political and activist practices in the fields of art and research. What is the purpose of being part of a 106-year-old women's artist association? Why do we want to keep it alive through our unpaid work? The current board consists of feminist artists, architects, teachers, researchers, and activists. As a collective, we are confronted with a dilemma that we have to act within an art system that has a remarkable capacity of appropriating and incorporating any critique of its actions for the creation of profitable commodities for the few. As a consequence, our current feminist struggle must be fought in very different ways than those led by the founding members of the VBKU at the beginning of the 20th century, or even the feminist artists of the 1970s. When considering labels such as feminist art, as well as many other categories, which mainly serve a capitalist logic of exploitation, one of our biggest questions has been, what does it take to run a feminist art space today? How can approaches and practices from different linguistic and geopolitical spaces be brought together into a productive dialogue? How can we not lose sight of the dangers and temptations of appropriation? How can a critical handling of colonial continuities and differing forms of exclusion be included in the artistic everyday? 
The philosopher Michel Foucault claims that the archive identifies possibilities and limits. Das Archiv ist zunächst das Gesetz dessen, was gesagt werden kann. Das System, das das Erscheinen der Aussagen als einzelner Ereignisse beherrscht. Das Archiv ist das, was an der Wurzel der Aussage selbst, als Ereignis und in dem Körper, in dem es sich gibt, von Anfang an das System ihrer Aussagbarkeit definiert. The first public presentations of the Fabrika Ur archive in 2004 and 2006 through the exhibition Archiv and the publication of a Finnbuch or Finding Aid, respectively, can be understood in his attempt to legitimize the association and, in the long run, to make its histories known. As we went through the letters that announced the changes in the board to the Austrian Association Authority, we realized that committed members in the 1970s had already been actively involved in the association during National Socialism. In 1944, one year before the end of the Nazi regime, the painter Greta Kment Montandon became the fifth president of the association. After having held the position of vice president since 1940, she became the president following the death of her predecessor, the avowed National Socialist Stephanie Hollenstein. Kment Montandon held the position for 24 years. What do the affects trigger when we look at these images? In the archive's inventory list, these images are dated around 1975. They are the only images of the association's rooms that can be found in the archive. They show Kment Montandon standing between two other women who we do not recognize. What we do recognize is the large studio window with this distinctive grid frame, which still identifies the exhibition space of the Fabrika Ud today. Kment Montandon had already been active in the association since the 1920s. These images show Kment Montandon among her works, mainly portraits and landscape paintings in pastels and oil. According to the entries in the accounting books, we learn that Kment Montandon rented parts of the association as her studio space from the 1970s until her death in 1986. In the archive, we find materials which document the various travels of Kment Montandon in the 1960s, 1970s, and 1980s. She traveled with her friend and colleague, Yvonne Kellner, through the USA in 1965 to visit Native American reservations, to India in 1976, and to Iraq in the mid-1980s during the first Gulf War. We find postcards that appall us. The producer of the postcards is Yvonne Kellner, and the pastel drawings are by Kment Montandon. The postcards challenge us. They bring up complex questions and evoke ghosts that cannot be cast out. A 
Aside from still lifes, representative paintings, and landscapes, portraits were an artistic genre most welcomed by National Socialism. According to the art historian Helene Keta, the other was generally not worthy of depiction in National Socialism, with the exception of those others that were racially highly ranked by the National Socialist race ideologies. What does it mean to live with ghosts? To share a scene with them? To hear their voices? To follow them around for a while? A whisper, a secret, a darkness, a death. A whisper, a secret, a darkness, a death. In 1942, in the second annual exhibition of the Vereinigung Bildender Künstlerinnen der Reichsgauer, Kment Montandon showed her artwork, Image of an Armenian Woman. In the 1920s and 1930s, numerous race researchers supported the thesis that Armenians are related to Jews. Under the Nazi regime in 1933, the German ministry issued the statement that Armenians belong to the Aryans. These drawings were not the only time that Kment Montendon depicted subjects that were dealt with as topics within discourses on race and racial belonging by the National Socialists. It is striking that after 1945, Kment Montandon and Kellner only visited countries that had either been supported by the National Socialists or whose cultures had been ideologically appropriated by the National Socialists. In May of 1941, the German Air Force supported Iraq. Leading National Socialists became interested in Indian philosophy and yoga and utilized them for their goals. National Socialist ideology used Native American imagery in order to construct and reinforce its own national identity. In 1965, Kment Montandon and Kellner went on a five-month tour of the USA by car. They traveled to Native American reservations, which were located in different, partly very distant states, like Arizona, Washington, or South Dakota. We do not know exactly which reservations were included in their trip, but the descriptions on the backs of the postcards let us assume that they visited the Macaw Reservation, the Hopi Reservation, the Warm Springs Indian Reservation, the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, the Rosebud Indian Reservation, and the Wind River Indian Reservation. Like the portraits, the descriptions play into cultural stereotypes which Kment Montandon and Kellner presented in Vienna in 1966 in their exhibition, The Indiana, or Indian, Today. The historian Robert F. Burkhofer explains that the general term Indiana, or Indian, demands a definition and this definition was assumed through a description of moral qualities and customs. In short, character and culture were united into one summary judgment by and for whites. In these descriptions, the anecdotal descriptions on the back of the postcards also draw your attention. Kment Montandon and Kellner wrote in the invitation booklet that the name Indiana still evokes the romantic imaginary among us Europeans. These romantic and cliché-loaded imaginaries go back to the emerging national movements in the 18th century in Europe. The historian Frank Uzbek claims that, from the first colonial encounters until today, the perception of Native Americans in German-speaking society reflects problems, fears, desires, and struggles. In his opinion, images of Indiana could be used to draw conclusions about society, whether they reflect the sociocultural problems of the absolutist mini-states in the 18th century, nationalism and cultural pessimism of the 19th century, or national socialism during the 20th century. What is mirrored here? Which ghosts encounter one another here? Uzbek writes that German newspaper reports on the United States between 1933 and 1945 illustrate anti-American positions behind the fascination of the figure of the Indianer. There are reports on the Indian New Deal in 1934, race relations between the USA and Latin America were analyzed, praise was given for authors like Karl May or James F. Cooper, and anti-American allegations were spread. He describes how the propaganda of the National Socialists used motives of the tribe members and of the common enemy 
to express contempt for the alleged lack of culture in the American civilization. Various ideologies lie behind Kment Bontadon and Kellner's postcards. They contain a longing for a return to nature and spirituality. They express these romantic, anti-modern desires in their portrayals of the Indiana as carriers of a dying, pre-modern culture. Kment, Montandon, and Kellner were also eager to show a certain level of authenticity. They wanted to challenge clichés while maintaining common stereotypes. In the year 1966, National Socialist descriptions and misappropriations continued to linger in their oversimplified representations of the Indiana today. At the same time that Kment Montendon and Kellner were on their journey, strong uprisings by Native American groups and organizations in the USA developed. For instance, in 1964, the Survival of American Indians Association organized a protest campaign against the brutality of local police against Native fishermen on the Puyallup River in Washington. And after about 40 Sioux occupied Alcatraz Island in the San Francisco Bay for a few hours in 1964 in order to reclaim their land, the group Indians of All Tribes occupied the island again in a demonstration for the rights of Native Americans from 1969 to 1971. To this day, many Native American groups and organizations still struggle for their land, sovereignty, health care, voting rights, education, and basic infrastructure such as running water. The portraits of the artist and the researcher fit into a series of seemingly endless efforts to control the discourse on Indianertum, or being Indian in the German-speaking area. The historian H. Glenn Penny describes how popular clichés were thereby denounced in order to replace them with new versions of the authentic Indiana. Here the ghosts of appropriation through colonial fantasies and national socialist ideologies interact. They know different time periods and they overlap. They can't let go of each other and they always return. A whisper, a secret, a darkness, a death. A whisper, a secret, a darkness, a death. We both grew up in the 1980s in a white middle class context in Vienna. It was common in our childhood to play cowboys and Indians. With these portrayals, the archive of the association allows us to embark upon a troublesome interaction without interacting with ghosts of colonial fantasies and national socialist ideologies. To live otherwise and better, no, not better justly, but with them, even and especially if they are objectionable and dangerous ghosts. How can we not lose sight of the dangers and temptations of appropriation? In a letter from 1968, the Faubica board asks Kment Montandon to resign. Kellner's unlawful entry into the space of the Faubica is mentioned as a reason, as well as both of them using the letterhead, address, and phone number of the association for their personal objectives. Kment Montandon resigned from her position as president after 24 years. However, she continued to rent the spaces of the association as her studio until her death in 1986. Going through the press releases sent out during the presidency of Kment Montanon and her team, we found papers with the same text and a few annotations. It seems the same text the same wording and the same message was used over and over for more than 10 years. The text was copied time and time again from the 1950s to the mid-1960s.
Der Erste Weltkrieg beendete unerwartet die Ausstellungsaktivitäten der Vereinigung, um die Räumlichkeiten in den Dienst des Krieges zu stellen. Es wurde ein Kindergarten eingerichtet, sowie Näh- und Strickecken, wo Kleidung für Spezialspatienten und Soldaten hergestellt wurde. Im Jahresbericht wurden nicht mehr die Mitglieder genannt, sondern Geld- und Sachspenden sowie genähte und gestrickte Kleidungsstücke, das Krankenhaus, für das sie arbeiteten und die Namen der abreisenden Soldaten, die ihre hergestellten Produkte bekamen. Die VBKÖ übernahm somit die karikative Funktion älterer, adeliger Wohlfahrtsvereine. Um wieder Ausstellungen machen zu können, suchte die VBKÖ 1915 um eine staatliche Förderung an, damit die Räume in ihren ursprünglichen Zustand gebracht werden konnten. Die Regierung, die die künstlerischen Ansätze und den patriotischen Einsatz der Vereinigung anerkannte, bewilligte die Förderungen. The press releases refrained from elaborating on the association's own role in the years during the two world wars by simply omitting its patriotic activities during the First World War, as well as its national socialist incarnations. In ihren nationalsozialistischen Inkarnationen veranstaltete die Vereinigung Propagandaausstellungen mit Titeln wie Kreuz und Quer durch unsere Gaue und nahm an der Ausstellung der eines Frauenschaft künstlerisches Frauenschaffen teil. The VBKÖ Archive contains a formal apology from 1948, which describes a reproach regarding the evil Nazi spirit in the association. As the following response to the Fabico shows, the association had previously filed a lawsuit. We find affidavits that attest to several members of the association belonging to neither the Nazi party nor any of its other national socialist formations. Through these affidavits and a lawsuit, the association rejected allegations of participating in national socialism. Therefore, the Fabrika U did not consider it necessary to clearly break away from its activities during that time period. It simply continued after 1945. During the 1970s, the enamel artist Gertrude Stör led the Faubike U as Kpent Montedon's successor. Stör was born in 1915 and is listed as a participating artist in the annual exhibition catalogues of 1942 and 1944. She became the treasurer of the Faubike U in 1960. In 1962, she took over as vice president. And in 1968, she was elected as the sixth president. She held that position for 19 years until her death in 1984 at the age of 69.
secret and darkness and death. A whisper and secret and darkness and death. A whisper and secret and darkness and death. The Getreu de Stur Enamel Museum is located in the Fischertorm, a former military defense tower on the castle grounds of Forchdorf, the hometown of the artist. The museum also preserves documentations of Stur's work. The Enamel Museum was established by Stur herself and opened in 1983. Visitors can see 220 paintings, scarves, brooches, pendants, chalices, and crosses, and all the techniques of enamel art, filleted enamel, vitreous enamel, cloison enamel, enamel painting, and Limoges enamel. The man who unlocked the door for us to the enamel museum is also the founder of the Museum of Local History in Forchdorf, where he also takes care of its collection. Stor, too, ran the association with a team. There were nine artists in total on the board and in the working committee, the majority of which had already worked closely with the Faubica since 1941. The ceramic artist Rotraud Brauneis was one of the few who already became a member in the 1950s. Along with Gertrude Stor, she ran the Faubica as vice president from 1968 to 1984. Stjö and her team organized several exhibitions. They applied for subsidies at the Bundesministerium für Unterricht und Kunst with the Federal Ministry of Education and Art and the Magistrat der Stadt Wien, municipality of the city of Vienna. They invited politicians and prominent figures to their openings and asked them to hold opening speeches. They organized sales of artworks and they wrote thank you letters to their buyers and guests. Stör and Brauner shared a focus on the applied arts, working with enamel and ceramic, respectively. Under their management, they maintained the steady rhythm of organizing two exhibitions a year, a format already established by Kment Montandon and her team. The spring exhibition was to be at an external, more representative location, such as the Kunstlerhaus, and the Christmas exhibition was to take place at the association space. While both events serve the purpose of selling artworks, the first one was dedicated to fine arts and the latter to applied arts by featuring everyday objects like lamps, vases, and decorations, thereby targeting the Christmas shoppers. The Fabrica U archive does not provide any photos of these exhibitions, but it has stored two press reviews that are suggestive of the predominant techniques interests and subjects that were most common in the Fabrica U during those years.
The spring exhibition took place from May 5th to the 25th. The Fabrika U paid 17,500 shillings, which amounts to approximately 4,400 euros in rent, and had sales of 17,020 shillings, approximately 4,300 euros today. The exhibition had 985 visitors. In other words, the Fabrika U was an active association run by and for women artists. They were, however, completely out of touch with the feminist art movement, or the women's movement in Austria or elsewhere during the 1970s. At the end of the 1990s, we came to know about feminist art, the students in art and architecture. Nina and Daniela Hammer-Tugendhat seminars at the University of Applied Arts, and Julia and Ute Meta Bauer's seminars at the Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna. Our paths had not crossed yet then. Being young feminist students at the end of the 1990s also meant being aware that any political gains, even those that seem the most established, can never be taken for granted. Even more so if we think of the art system, a social subsystem of capitalism as a global system of exploitation and control, of which we are undoubtedly part. Today the art world is increasingly unequal and is based on the successes of the few as it generates artistic value from scarcity. Artists who lack the privileges of being white, male, heterosexual, and at least middle class are still less represented, less paid, less socially protected, and less discussed. In other words, they are more precarious and more vulnerable. In the 1970s, Women artists challenged male dominance in the Viennese art world, including, for instance, the feminist artist network Intact, International Action Community of Women Artists, and Valley Export, to name but two. 1975 protestieren wir gegen eine Frauenausstellung, die von einer rein männlich besetzten Jury ausgewählt und im Völkerkundemuseum veranstaltet wurde. Nach zwei Jahren vorbereitender Planung gründeten wir 1977 intakt. Unsere Ziele sind immer noch die Verbesserung der Situation der bildenden Künstlerinnen auf sozialem und künstlerischem Gebiet, die aktive Anteilnahme am aktuellen kulturpolitischen Gebiet und das aktive Engagement zu existenziell wichtigen Problemen. Die Stellung der Kunst in der Frauenbewegung ist die Stellung der Frau in der Kunstbewegung. Although the Fabrika U had no contact with the women's movements in the 1970s and was more or less unknown, according to Export, and had a rather old-fashioned program, according to Intact associate Laura Horemann, at the beginning of the 20th century, the association had established ties with the women's movement of its time. In 1912, they joined the Bund Österreichische Frauenvereine, Federation of Austrian Women's Organization, which was founded in 1902 by Marianne Heinisch, the founder and leader of the Austrian women's movement. The Fabrika U participated with an exhibition in the International Women's Suffrage Conference, which took place from June 11th to the 12th in 1913 in Vienna. And when other art spaces and the Academy of Fine Arts did not allow women to enroll, they campaigned for women's admission into those all-male institutions. Six years later, in 1919, Austria granted the general, equal, direct, and secret right to vote to all citizens, regardless of gender. In addition, the Academy of Fine Arts opened enrollment to women in the 1920-1921 school year. Mein Buch The Memory Factory zeigt auf, dass die VPKÖ 1910 die erste Künstlerinnenvereinigung war, die ausschließlich für Frauen zugänglich war und gleichzeitig eine beträchtliche Unterstützung durch die Regierung erhielt und 
Sie war die erste Frauengruppe, die ihren eigenen Ausstellungsraum leitete. Eines der Ziele der VPKÖ war es, die Beziehungen von Künstlerinnen in Österreich zu stärken, indem sie Ausstellungsmöglichkeiten anbot. Die VPKÖ führte internationale und kosmopolitische Kooperationen durch und agierte dabei als eine nicht-politische, kulturelle Botschafterin. Die Kunst kann ein Medium unserer Selbstbestimmung sein und diese bringt der Kunst neue Werte. Diese Werte werden über den kulturellen Zeichenprozess die Wirklichkeit verändern, einer Anpassung an die weiblichen Bedürfnisse entgegen. Die Zukunft der Frau wird die Geschichte der Frau sein. Nevertheless, as the Memory Factory and the VBKÖ archive reveal, women artists had already started to write their histories by the end of the 19th century in Vienna. In dieser Hinsicht ist es wichtig zu betonen, dass mit Ende 1945 beinahe drei Generationen von Künstlerinnen aus rassistischen oder politischen Gründen nur selten ästhetischen ausgelöscht wurden. Sie wurden ins Exil vertrieben, in Konzentrationslager deportiert und ihre Arbeiten wurden aus Museen und öffentlichen Einrichtungen entfernt. Danach wirkten die Geschlechterpolitiken auf die Produktion von Kunstkritik und letztendlich der Kunstgeschichtsschreibung ein, um Arbeiten von Künstlerinnen zu verunglimpfen und schlussendlich vieler ihrer Beiträge aus dem Gedächtnis zu löschen. How can a critical handling of colonial continuities and differing forms of exclusion be included in the artistic everyday? At the end of the 1990s, the photographer and art historian Rudolfina Lackner born in 1967, became the ninth president of the Fabrika U. She was 42 years younger than her predecessor, Elisabeth Demarest. With the publication of the association's archive inventory in 2006, the Fabrika U would be able to begin dealing with its own history. Rather than predominantly shedding light on the histories of singular, outstanding women artists, the Fabrika U archive provides insight into the context of works their social and conceptual histories, and the discourses within which the women artists worked. The archive does not host many names belonging to the canonical lists of women artists. The stories that the archive can tell us about the association and its members are very complex and politically contradictory. For as much as the initial ambitions and achievements of the Fabrika U may serve as a historical point of departure for subsequent feminist movements, Many aspects of the ensuing developments and activities of the association have been politically opportunistic, fatal, and structurally complicated. Das Archiv hat die Möglichkeit, das wiederherzustellen, was im Neoliberalismus regelmäßig verloren geht. Nicht Geschichte selbst, sondern vielmehr die Fähigkeit, die Bedingungen unseres Lebensalltags und noch wichtiger, die Überzeugung, dass wir selbst einmal wieder Akteurinnen des Wandels in der Zeit und der Geschichte sein werden können. We consider the VBKÖ archive to be a site of political confrontation, of action and intervention in the present, of reprojection and reimagination of the future, and to welcome specters. A whisper, a secret, a darkness, a death. In 2015, more than a million people who were fleeing wars and or dire economic situations crossed into Europe, often risking their lives to do so. Reports on refugees have been sparking heated discussions and tensions all over Europe. In Austria, as in many other countries, a right-wing rhetoric of fear has dominated the political discourse, calling for deportations and additional measures for strengthening Fortress Europe. 
A specter haunts the world, and it is a specter of migration. A whisper, a secret, a darkness, a death. In October 2015, we received the following letter, which will find its way into the archive too. Subject, hanging flag slash banner, blinds. Dear tenant, according to another tenant of Kantnerstrasse 32 slash 34, a flag or banner is hanging out of one of your windows, which is making them feel uncomfortable in their own home. Please note that this is not suitable for a representative business building, and on behalf of the property owner, we hereby request that you remove this item at once and refrain from such activities in the future. If the above-mentioned irregularities should cause rent losses or other disadvantages to the property owner, you leave us no other choice but to take legal action. Best regards, building management. The board decided to remove the banner. What a cowardly feminist spirit. As one board member got to hear of it, she stated, the banner clearly disturbed the repression of public and social everyday life. A specter haunts the world, and it is a specter of migration. A whisper, a secret, a darkness, a death. How can approaches and practices from different linguistic and geopolitical spaces be brought together into a productive dialogue? The histories of the Fabrikau draw us in. They draw us in, but they can also drag us down into their haunting presence. The being with the specters of Nazi ideologies and colonial fantasies will continue to challenge us.